Okay, my main fields of research are in the area of innovation and entrepreneurship. Most of my research currently are in the area of entrepreneurship. Uh, for example, trying to understand why people become entrepreneurs, what are their motivations for doing so, um, how much money do they make and how difficult is it to be successful. And I also look at uh, things like um, what kind of policies can uh, governments or local governments uh, create in order to maybe stimulate uh, useful entrepreneurship. Uh, that, that's most of my research today. Well, so there are probably two main applications of the research today. Uh, one is for individuals uh, who are thinking uh, about maybe becoming an entrepreneur, starting a business, uh, taking over a family business, uh, or, or doing something similar to that. And um, what I do is I provide some basic information to these people about uh, you know, what they can expect in terms of how much money they could make. Uh, how likely they are to succeed depending on the type of uh, project they're, they're uh, trying to start and, um, uh, and trying for them to understand and introspect about sort of the, the whole idea about becoming an entrepreneur. Why do you want to become an entrepreneur or what's the point of this? Because for most people actually it's, it's much better to stay employed than to become an entrepreneur. The, the standard result in, 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 in research is that 75% of all people that become entrepreneurs uh, would have been better off if they'd taken a job instead or if they stayed employed, if, if, if they went from employment to, to, to uh, becoming an entrepreneur. So normally then it's very hard for, for sort of expected utility, economic type of considerations to explain uh, why a certain individual becomes an entrepreneur and therefore Usually what we uh, try to do is uh, we try to use other types of models or extended models of uh, the expected utility framework where we l look into decision biases or for example whether uh, people uh, evaluate probabilities differently they, or they might be overconfident or they might be optimistic or over optimistic about the opportunity or they might in fact just prefer to become an entrepreneur. So it's not so much about the money but it's more about the lifestyle, uh, the hours that it allows you to work. Uh, maybe you want to care for your family or someone uh, that's near to you and you want to be flexible with your time. And there are many other considerations like this. And, and if this is ep explicated to people, maybe then they will be less disappointed if things don't go so well because many of these types of businesses that are started for uh, non-profit making uh, reasons uh, they usually don't do that well and, and you know, if, if you then later become disappointed about that or you lose a lot of money, then you know, maybe you shouldn't have started in the first place. When it comes to the other application or, or the other main application, it's for public policy. So if it's the case that um, a lot of people uh, start businesses because uh, they are not optimizing the monetary utility of, of the business, the, the, the money that they will make from it, but rather for other reasons, then maybe one should think twice about encouraging people to become entrepreneurs because it might be that if you encourage uh, basically everyone by, by public subsidies, giving people extra stimulus in terms of uh, reducing the costs of starting a company or, or even giving them subsidies and tax write-offs and things like that. There are many such policies in place today in, in Europe and in Spain. Uh, then maybe these, uh, these should be reconsidered because you're just uh, getting a lot of people that would have made more money as an employee to start a company which would uh, give them and society as a whole uh, less, uh, less economic development. So it actually might stimulate uh, a lower rate of economic development by stimulating entrepreneurship. So, so that would be a bad public policy. So um, if it's the case that most people enter entrepreneurship for, for these non-monetary utilities, preferences for being your own boss and so forth, then maybe we shouldn't have so many people doing that. I mean, they will be happier. People will be, might be enjoying themselves, so that might be fine. But there's no need to economically stimulate people to do so. They will 
they will become entrepreneurs anyway. It's like uh, smoking, right? If, uh, if people smoke, you know, uh, people are, some people that smoke are happier because they do that, but it's not a good idea to, to you know, help people to become more of a smoker. It's, it's not that good for society. So, so in, that, in that sense, you know, knowing more about what drives people to become entrepreneurs is useful for public policy. And then one can maybe consider to have more targeted public policies to situations where it makes more sense from an overall social economic perspective uh, for, 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 the, for the government of, of, of France or for the government of Spain to, to really encourage certain types of, of people. For example, today um, in France and, and uh, where I work and uh, in Spain here, there's a lot of immigrants. Uh, and a lot of them are refugees from, uh, from other countries and so forth, and many of these people don't have a job. So for people that don't have a job, um, you're, you're on uh, unemployment insurance, they are not happy, uh, there's a lot of tension in society for them, um, and, and the society as a whole pays for these people by the unemployment insurance. So maybe there's some way to encourage these people to actually get a job, maybe not super well paid, but at least they, they are able to pay for themselves and for their rent and so forth, and the society don't need to pay for their unemployment insurance. So one particular thing that has uh, allowed a lot of immigrants to currently earn money easily is to be a driver for Uber, right? So in, in Paris, for example, uh, an average Uber driver uh, makes about 3,600 euros per month, which is a very decent salary. And the only thing you have to do is you have to get a driver's license and uh, you have to take a test for Uber and so forth. You have to be classified by them and then you can, you can have your car and you can drive. And, and you can wear a suit, you know, you have a nice shirt on and you make good money. So a good public policy would be to allow Uber to exist in Europe and a bad public policy uh, from an entrepreneurship perspective would be to ban it, which uh, many politicians are now talking about doing and it has been banned in, in several local municipalities. I, I believe, for example, in, in, in uh, Milan and now they're talking about banning it in Paris and, uh, and in France in general. And uh, of course, it's, it's for reasons that has not anything to do with economic efficiency that, that one is thinking about banning Uber. So there you have an example of public policy implications. I've been uh, quite fortunate to be in the management department. Uh, there's a lot of really good researchers there. And I've started three projects after I came here. Um, uh, one with um, Neus Palomeras and Emre Enkinch, um, uh, both in the management department. And in that project, we're interested in looking at um, the mobility of inventors. Um, I have some Swedish data on, uh, or I have access to some Swedish data on the mobility of uh, Swedish inventors, uh, people that have invented um, ideas and then have applied for a patent at the European Patent Office. And, and uh, Emre and Neus and also uh, another person, Eduardo Melero, they have together written a paper that's trying to explain uh, what happens to inventors uh, when they receive a patent. Uh, are they able to um, find another job in another company because they now have a signal of high quality? Um, they show that they're good inventors, so they're more employable outside uh, their current employment. Uh, and is it the case that they're able to bargaining, uh, using this information as a bargaining chip towards their current employer to raise their salary? So the data from Sweden will be able to test these uh, ideas. Uh, it's quite interesting. I have a second project with uh, Jose Penalva. Um, so here again, I'm bringing the data. Um, uh, it's about crowdfunding. I don't know if you know what crowdfunding is, but uh, this particular website called Cedars is the uh, second largest equity crowdfunding website 
in Europe, and it's located in London. They have their headquarters there. Uh, a lot of their offices are also in, in Portugal. Um, so um, if you want to start a company, uh, you can now raise funds from the crowd, from people you don't know at all. And this is very, very different from before. The market for getting startup capital has suddenly exploded because of this opportunity to go to one of these websites, put your project on the web, say, I want to raise 100,000 euros. And then anyone can go onto this website and invest if they want to. The website provider takes a cut on the investment, and if the whole campaign, which is called, uh, campaign is uh, you know, the goal of raising, let's say, 100,000, if that's uh, succeeded, then this money is sent to the entrepreneur. Uh, the website also takes a cut on, on the amount sent to the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur gets their funding and can go ahead and do their project, and then if they're successful, the investors will get a return on their investment. This is all very new. It started in 2011 in the United Kingdom. These investments are beneficiary uh, for the investors from a tax uh, write-off perspective in England. So you get a very reduced tax rate on these investments in early stage companies. Um, and, and so it can be useful to do that instead of you know, investing in regular stocks or bonds. Um, but you have to believe in the projects, of course, otherwise you wouldn't do it. And so what Jose and I and, and two other researchers in, 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 at Oxford University, Nita Vilken and Manuel Fernandez Sierra, what we're looking at is what's the dynamic process of these investments in a campaign? That These campaigns are fixed. They're go, they go on for 60 days. In the beginning, there's a, a, usually a rush of investments, some early spikes, and some really big investments or there's really nothing, and then the campaign never succeeds. So there's some campaigns that, that, that succeed and raise all the money. There's some campaigns that very early in the first week maybe fail and don't raise the money that they have um, hoped to raise. And the question is, what happens in this early process? Um, what is the dynamics of uh, somebody investing? Will I follow that person? And will other people follow me? And so in finance, this is called herding. And this type of herding behavior might not be based on a lot of uh, useful information, but might be, be based just based on what other people are doing. So you can have these really strong herding effects where people sort of crowd into a particular project without much information being revealed, except that others are making the same decisions. So the question is whether this is economically rational or not. Uh, what's, wh what's going on here? Why are people making these decisions? And, and this is something that we're quite keen on, on looking into. That's with Jose, and then I have a third paper. Um, and this is with uh, Eduardo Melero. It's not a, really a paper yet, we're just talking about it, but we're looking into European patents and, and what is the value of patents in general. We're, we're very keen on, and, and others with us are very interested in, in learning more about you know, what is the mechanism behind patenting? So wh why does it help companies to, to get a patent? And when does it not help them to get a patent? How does it affect uh, uh, future outcomes for the startups that get a patent? Do they get more employees because they have a patent? And do they get more financing? And, and what is the reason for why these outcomes, uh, given that you get a, a patent? Is it because you release some credit constraints? Is it because you provide a signal of quality? Is it because you have something to barter with in a, in a dispute uh, about who did what? Uh, for example, if you have a patent, it's much more uh, easy to counter sue somebody else for patent infringement or, or something like that. So there are many different outcomes that we can look at with this, and, and we have some ideas about uh, how we want to pursue this, looking specifically at patents that have been applied for in Europe. So those are the three projects that I, I have started with um, after coming here, and they won't be finished uh, during this uh, uh, six months that I'm here, but uh, we will at least gotten uh, somewhere along the road uh, towards uh, papers for all these three projects.